We'll uh, continue here without uh, interruption with Dana Portnier, who is going to talk to us about bipolar energy. Dana? Thank you very much. This is forward. This is your baton. Here we go. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to present. I'm going to discuss uh, bipolar radio frequency electrosurgery, which is sort of a uh, modern terminology uh, for what I would always call just bipolar cautery. Um, but I think it highlights that some of the modern bipolar devices, as I see it, have really revolutionized surgery, as I see it, and our speed and efficiency in the operating room. And I think to get to being able to adequately discuss the modern devices, we need to kind of go through the history of bipolar a little bit. And Dr. Monroe, you know, very eloquently went through some of the fundamentals of uh, electrosurgery, and I want to backtrack and cover just a few of those, again, that relate to bipolar energy. And, you know, electrons, as we know, flow between two poles, and in the majority of the energy that we use, it's alternating current, where the poles uh, 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 change uh, at a certain frequency, and what comes out of our wall is an alternating frequency of 60 hertz per second. So the poles alternate 60 hertz per second. And if we tried to use that in our electrosurgery, as Dr. Monroe, Monroe mentioned, the, the phreatic effect uh, would come into play and it would stimulate our muscles and nerves and, and cause an electric shock type injury, and so that's just not reasonable. And so we have fancy generators that uh, alter our uh, energy as it comes out, and it amplifies it in addition to multiple other effects to make the frequency from 350 kilohertz up to 5 uh, megahertz, which in our frequency spectrum brings us into the radio frequency spectrum where electrosurgery lies. And with that high frequency in that range, it then makes it so that our own tissues, the biological processes of our tissues, aren't affected uh, by way of that uh, energy. And to keep things consistent, I stole last night and switched out one or two of my slides with Dr. Monroe's without his permission, so I hope he doesn't beat me up. Um, but uh, uh, this is how monopolar uh, works, where, you know, with, in what we talk about monopolar and bipolar, because all electrosurgery is bipolar by way of the alternating current, uh, where the electrodes dance between the tr two electrodes, but as he put it, it's where you place those electrodes. And with our monopolar, the end effector, or the bovi, is one electrode, and then the dispersive electrode is the other. And therefore, those electrons travel through the patient, and that's where disarray can occur. That's where complications can occur, burn injuries to the patient and things like that if you have problems with your dispersive electrode. Um, with bipolar energy, it's uh, very different. In one end effector, you have both electrodes so that the tissue that gets co-opted between the two uh, electrodes is the only path really where the electrodes where the electrons flow. They don't go in through the patient in its entirety. Um, and that has some benefits. Um, it means you don't require the dispersive electrode. Um, capacitance, as Dr. Brunt covered in his lecture, is not an issue with bipolar cautery because the two magnetic fields of the two electrodes cancel one another out and cause capacitive coupling to not be an issue. Uh, the energy primarily stays between the jaws, and as a result of it not having to travel through the patient and all the different uh, resistances of the patient's body, it ob overall requires less voltage and current. And I think that translates overall that bipolar energy, by and large, is safer than monopolar energy. However, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have its own issues. And one is what I like to term the mushroom effect. And as that tissue is between the two jaws of your bipolar device, 
the tissue between that tissue, as you, uh, uh, between the devices, as you start your flow of electrons through, it starts to heat that tissue, which starts the desiccation process, the disbursement of the water from within the cells. And the water is that conductor of the uh, energy. And as it desiccates and, and that water plumes outward as, as sort of steam bursts that heat the lateral temperatures, impedance increases as well. And electricity likes to take the path of least resistance. So it starts to mushroom around the jaws, causing lateral thermal spread. And uh, Dr. Monroe showed the video that he had said was from 20 years ago that showed a fair degree of lateral thermal spread uh, with his uh, bipolar device that was used. And that also leads to one other difference between bipolar energy than uh, simply monopolar is that you can use your bipolar devices underwater or under blood or, or, or bodily fluids, and that can potentially in some situations be used to your advantage. Since those electrons only have to flow between the two electrodes that are closely co-apted, the, the electrons are able to flow, whereas if you tried to use monopolar energy in fluid or saline, uh, your uh, current density would be lost by the fact that the water is a conductor and would just disperse that current density and not make it effective. And therefore, by being using monopolar polar, you can use that, and there's certain applications, especially uh, neurosurgical applications, where they'll actually drip water over the bipolar devices at the time to keep down that lateral thermal spread and, uh, and, and use that to their advantage. Uh, also, though, to, to make bipolar work effectively, you have to adequately co your tissue together. It's that bringing the vessel walls together so that you can get the adequate tissue desiccation so that it stops the actual blood flow so that you don't get the cooling effect that the blood traveling through can occur. And that allows for the desiccation and the protein coagulation that allows you to get the overall coagulation that you want. However, coaptation with standard bipolar devices can be inconsistent. And one problem can often be overcompression. And with overcompression, you can then squeeze the tissue to a point that the two electrodes actually touch. And then, therefore, the electricity actually bypasses the tissue altogether and circulates between the two electrodes, giving you, the surgeon, maybe this false perception that you're getting adequate coagulation of your tissue when you're actually not. And so that can be misleading. And so while I think bipolar, traditional bipolar energy is overall safer than monopolar energy, it is, does have its own limitations. It, it does provide continuous uninterrupted delivery of energy. But the surgeon controls that delivery of energy, and the surgeon uses the only cl clues that we have because we don't have any feedback mechanism other than visual cues. And so we look at thermal spread. Uh, which by the time we see it, it's probably too much. Uh, we look for carbonization, which is actually what we don't want because that leads to sticking in the coagulum that all leads to sort of tearing apart what you've just done. There's been people in the past that have put inline amp meters uh, and things to try to let surgeons be able to watch this and judge the level of uh, coagulation that they were getting, but these have been proven to be ineffective in studies and actually uh, were shown to promote excessive thermal damage. And these devices overalls tend to coap tissue poorly and or therefore making coagulation often incomplete. Um, but modern bipolar devices and technology is different. Uh, they have a feedback mechanism that uh, looks at things. And we'll look at that more in detail in a second. But those feedback mechanisms allow for overall better and more consistent hemostasis. They allow for what we want, which is less thermal spread. They allow for less plume formation, less tissue carbonization and sticking. And they allow us to seal big vessels, up to 7 millimeter vessel sealing indication for most of our bipolar devices that are out there nowadays. Um, how does this occur? Well, it occurs by way of smart generator technology is one method that's used. And in near real time feedback, uh, these generators measure impedance and get feedback from the end effector or the delivery device. So the delivery device 
is judging the impedance of the tissue, feeding that back to the generator, which has a computerized brain, which is making calculations to help determine what levels of energy it should be providing. And rather than traditional bipolar, where we by and large see continuous flow of energy, uh, the smart generators of, generators of today by and large use a pulsing energy where it's rapid on-off energy that's delivered and this allows for interval cooling of the uh, tissue. And then many of the devices today will provide us, the surgeon, an audible signal that we can hear that allows us to uh, know that we have adequate coagulation of our tissue, that it has, by way of its feedback mechanisms, determined the impedance and the feedback cycle to know that we have adequate coagulation of the tissue. Uh, there's other mechanisms by which some of the devices work as well. Some actually work at the level of the end effector down at the very jaws themselves. Uh, oh, um, one of those uh, uses what they call nanotechnology, which is there's actually a polymer down in the end of the device uh, that responds to temperature, essentially. And as it reaches that 100 degrees Celsius, there's actually a physical change in that polymer and or expansion that separates some nickel uh, uh, that's within there and prevents it from uh, conducting the uh, energy at that point. And, and that happens at, at, at a, a uh, at variable places along the actual blade of the, or jaw of the device itself. So at each individual spot along the jaw, depending on what the temperature is at that local environment, it's either expanded or not, which so it either conducts uh, energy there or not to uh, create the heat. Also, most of these devices use uh, some form of high jaw compression, which uh, allows for overall less uh, energy uh, delivery. Um, there is a number of devices that I think is ever expanding that are coming out with these bipolar ceiling devices, and I've probably missed some in my search for it. Um, and I think it would be unrealistic to think in the time frame that we have today that I can go through all the individual nuances of each of these devices. Uh, however, I implore you today in the lab to take a look at some of these devices that you may not have used and try to uh, look at the individual nuances of these devices. But there's some general themes that we see about these devices that overall, they work pretty well. Um, Here's a, a, a graph of uh, de various devices measuring their mean burst pressures, and you can see the burst pressure on the left, that they get uh, fairly uh, significant pressures uh, for vessels uh, varying from 2 to 7 millimeters in size. And if we think of systolic uh, blood pressure, which <coughs> probably is somewhere in the 120 to 220 range for the average individual. Uh, in many of these, we'll see that, that, the, that the ceiling strengths or the mean burst pressures are sometimes two or three times that uh, at various places. And, and it does it fairly quickly. You can see that in a matter of seconds, the majority of these devices are able to seal these vessels uh, significantly. Um, OK. Um, and these devices all function somewhat differently, um, and that I implore you to think about and how you use it in your practice, because there's pros and cons of each. <coughs> Some seal and divide the tissues simultaneously. That could be a pro, that could be a con, depending on you and your skill set and or who you're working with. Some will seal the tissue and then allow you to separate uh, the tissue or divide it by deploying a blade or something along those lines. That can be a pro, that can be a con, depending on your environment. Uh, some divide the tissue with a blade, others divide the tissue with energy. Um, there are, though, if you don't look at individual devices, there are some overall bipolar energy best practices. And I think the take-home message that I would talk about is I like to let the tissues lay in their natural anatomic plane, not on tension when I seal the devices, I think, uh, or when I seal vessels. I think tension is the clearest cut uh, en uh, enemy to any of these devices, and that if you have too much tension on your vessels when you seal them, that any of the devices will fail. 
You certainly want to keep your jaws cleaned, and your nurses should be uh, cleaning them uh, between uh, usages. Uh, some of the devices that will seal and not cut uh, will allow you to do overlapping seals if it's an area with uh, critical concern. Uh, I think they should be overlapping without gaps in between. Um, and then you can't put all your eggs in one basket, meaning you can't have all your faith in these devices. I think we as surgeons have to know the limitations of these devices and know that there are places where they will not, will not work. And there are certain patient factors that, that, that affect this. Uh, certainly patients with liver cirrhosis uh, don't do as well. Patients with chronic steroid use. Uh, patients with atherosclerosis and lots of calcifications in their vessels can have problems. Malnourished patients, systemic infections, diabetes, collagen vascular disease, because it's often the collagen that's uh, being sealed. So thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Dana. That was very interesting.